there's a, a meta story to this as well. Uh, but uh, for the sake of the the narrative, um, let's hold off on the recent update to this story that took place this week, because on Tuesday of this week, uh, there was to be a vote um, and it was going to be held not by a body of lawmakers, not by a panel of judges. But some other organization and this vote was going to dictate what the law essentially is for literally (laughs) millions and millions of people. Now, I'm not making this up, uh, even though it sounds impossible. Uh, What am I talking about? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a secret society kind of star chamber kind of stuff, right? But exactly. uh, There is this. There's this organization called the American Law Institute, and it's composed of uh, several thousand lawyers, law professors, prominent judges, uh, all the members of the Supreme Court are members of the American Law Institute. And they, uh, as part of their uh, their duties, uh, self-appointed duties, uh, they put together these things called restatements. And what restatements are is they look at the common law that is used in all 50 states, and they try to summarize sort of the 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 what the law is. As you say, uh, it, it's you can call it the cliff notes almost of 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 common law and it's very influential it's it's used by judges to to see what the sort of precedents are out there it's used by law students to teach uh, you know what the law actually says and is interpreted as uh so it's very influential it, even though it's you know nobody nobody sort of bestowed this honor upon the American Law Institute, but they've taken it upon themselves uh, as a prominent, preeminent uh, 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 organization in the legal profession to really uh, uh, put this together. And and they... All right. Let me, the let, last, me just, yeah, go ahead. let me just ask you a couple of questions before we go uh, forward on this. Is this, is this a dues-paying uh, institution? Like, how... Do you get appointed to this? Is there, I mean, it's what is invitation the... only? It's an invitation only organization. Uh, oh. And, and it really is the, the cream of the crop. I mean, we're talking about elite society. This is an elite gathering of legal minds. And, and they, they pay uh, dues presumably, right? I mean, or, or how do they get funded? I, I'm, I'm not sure how the funding uh, actually works. Uh, that's okay. a good question, but I don't So it's a answer. little bit, so it's a an elite institution that is invite-only, that is rather opaque in terms of where it gets its money, at least uh, <laughs> to some extent. And, at least to me. Okay, so um, <laughs> they take it upon themselves to assess and write cliff notes for the nation's laws, state to state, and yeah. who how, how is this peer reviewed who is, who checks on this i mean uh, well, you and i could... rigorous process i mean so so the one we're talking about is consumer contract law and the 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 restatement started in 2012 so this is seven years of review. Uh, it's typically farmed out to a, a, a sort of committee of uh, they call them reporters. They're really just co-authors uh, of this reinterpretation, this restatement of the law. Um, and, uh, you know, they get feedback from uh, other people within the organization. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I, I, my, my sense is, is that once these uh, co-authors are chosen, they're they're given a fair bit of discretion and leeway to 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 make these restatements. And in this case, you had a, a, a trio of uh, law professors that uh, you know are are part of the law and economics movement, which uh, we I believe talked about on the show before. It this is sort of the the, the right wing, uh, uh, very 
much interested in cost benefit analysis and economic efficiency and the law. Uh, it's sort of been this blending over of a sort of business friendly attitude to the legal profession. Uh, and so they approach this thing of consumer contracts. And we all know that this is a problem. Uh, I mean, Sam, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've, purchase something on, on iTunes or you, you purchase something in a website and there are terms and conditions and you're asked to click to agree to the terms and conditions. And I would say there's a 99.9% .9 chance that you never read any of the terms and conditions before clicking to agree with them. Let me, correct, let me correct you. It is a 100% <laughs> chance that I have not there read a single one of those conditions whatsoever. There it is. And everybody agrees on that. Right. Uh, the, 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 but, you know, the question is, how do you what do you how do you deal with that? Uh, and, and there are a variety of ways in the law to sort of still protect consumers that we know aren't reading the terms and conditions. But the one that these three authors, co-authors came up with is that consumers just wouldn't have to read the contracts to be bound by the terms as, as long as they had some sort of notice and a, quote, reasonable opportunity to review them, like if there was a link on the website about the, the terms and conditions, which could include the privacy policy, it could include an arbitration agreement uh, to settle any disputes or a waiver of class action status. It can include, you know, virtually anything. Uh, and you would just, as long as there's a link on that website and you show up to the website, you would be presumed to have agreed to all of those terms. Now, on the back end, the co-author said, okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll toughen up the standard of enforcement so that if there's something really bad in these terms and conditions, uh, you could litigate and, and, and you know, knock it out. Uh, it's, a, it's called a standard of unconscionability if, if, if the, the terms and conditions were unconscionable in some way. The problem with that, of course, is, uh, number one, you might be bound to an arbitration agreement, so you're never, never able to get in the court. Uh, and, I mean, just, just to dispute it in any fashion, you, you have to be, uh, you know, have the money to go up against a, a deep-pocketed corporation, and that's going to be a difficult road. So, um, you know, consumer protection advocates saw this as a real bulldozing of consumer rights. We know that the yeah. click and agree uh, uh, situation doesn't really work, but how could this be the solution? And how could this be a presumption of what the law says when it was based on case law that didn't seem to even fit uh, this, this, this restatement? Uh, it seemed more like a radical reinterpretation of the law rather than the restate. Well, first off, I mean, okay, <laughs> there are enormous problems, it seems with me, even if I was to accept the, that a, an organization like this, self-appointed, has so much influence on our law um, in this country, the process of having three people who the moment you say to me, come from this law and economics movement, I can already tell you that the nature of what they're going to come to. I mean, right, you're predisposed to having a certain perspective on how to assess these things. Mm -hmm. It necessarily, you could, it could be rigorous as, as rigorous as all you want, but um, it, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, and uh, people are predisposed. And the idea that there would be three professors who are the only ones uh, determining this all from the same uh, legal school of thought is uh, preposterous. I mean, I, you know, I, I, just from going first year law school, I can tell you uh, the implications <laughs> of going to to uh, specific lawyers who subscribe to a specific uh, school of thought. All right. Well, let's right. let's take a break here. Uh, and I want to talk about like, you know, so what's the recourse and further the implications here? Because, um, I mean, if I was to go in and sign a con, like, like if this is the case that just showing up there constitutes an agreement um, the between me and the company, one that I may not even seen, why should we just keep that to um, to online stuff? 
Right. And, right. and well, let's talk about um, um, how uh, uh, completely um, unfair and really um, uh, just bizarre this uh, this restatement is and what has happened to it. And are we all subject to it? We got to take a quick break. I'll be right back with David Dan. This is Ring of Fire Radio. <laughs> 